Hi everyone and thanks for joining me. This series of videos is going to cover the changes to the 2020 National Electrical Code and the topic for today's video is Article 240 Overcurrent Protection. Alright so there were a few changes in Article 240 starting with 240.6 which is the standard ampere ratings of circuit breakers and fuses. A password can now be used to determine the rating of an overcurrent device. This is kind of a, a cool change but it also potentially uh, has some built-in problems with it. So let's take a look. 240.6 uh, A gives us a list of the different ratings of circuit breakers and fuses that are considered to be standard ratings and we use that uh, in conjunction with 240.4b which is the next size up allowance for overcurrent devices that we can often use. 240.6b talks about adjustable trip circuit breakers and it says that the rating of an adjustable trip circuit breaker is the maximum setting unless the adjustment feature has restricted access. Okay, so what's the rating of this circuit breaker if I can change the settings from 400 amps to 2000 amps? Well, according to what we just read, this is a 2000 amp breaker regardless of what the settings are. So you would have to have 2000 amp conductors and everything that goes along with it, even if you set it to 400 amps. However, we need to keep reading into 240.6C which talks about restricted access adjustable trip circuit breakers. This one tells us that for adjustable trip circuit breakers, the adjusted setting, not the maximum setting, but the actual adjusted setting is considered the rating if the adjusting mechanism is one of the next four items. And to be perfectly honest, usually we match at least three of these in the real world. So very, very seldom would I have to worry about restricted access. Usually it, it happens whether you like it or not. So item one says that if the adjusting mechanism is behind a removable and sealable cover, then whatever I set it to is the setting of the circuit breaker. So we can look right here and to adjust the settings, we might have to remove a piece of plastic that's covering up the adjustments. If that's the case, then we've complied with the restricted access requirements and whatever I set the circuit breaker to is considered the rating of the circuit breaker. Item two is if the adjustment mechanisms are behind enclosure doors. And bear in mind, we don't need all of these. It's if any of these are true then we have already achieved restricted access. So usually when you buy an, an adjustable trip breaker, it's going to be behind a sealed cover. So we've already complied whether we like it or not. In addition to that, we oftentimes will have the circuit breaker behind a bolted enclosure door. And item three, we usually have that equipment behind locked doors that are accessible only to qualified persons. So in all honesty, Normally, we meet all of the different allowances for an adjustable trip circuit breaker to be considered restricted access, and you only need to have one of those three. Well, a new option four was added to the 2020 code, and it's rather interesting. Now, if changing the trip settings is done via a password, and that password is accessible only to qualified persons, then that's considered restricted access as well. So looking at the picture here, and there's, and there's several different ways that you can do this. Uh, this one goes through a graphical user interface here that you can see is Windows based. I can log in there with my username and password and potentially change the trip points of my electronic trip circuit breakers, of my, restrict, of my adjustable trip circuit breakers. So it's kind of a cool allowance, but it also brings up kind of a, an interesting discussion about security issues. If I can change the trip points by logging in and entering my username and password, well, then anybody who has that username and password can do it. And indeed, it is only supposed to be accessible to qualified persons. Now, if I have to be physically in the building to change these settings, then this probably isn't too much to worry about. But what if I can change the trip points from a remote location? That sounds like a very 
a user-friendly and convenient way to do things, and indeed it probably is, but if I can change these settings by logging into my computer at home, well, so could a cyber criminal. And it brings to light an interesting discussion that we're having during the 2023 revision process, which is, should cybersecurity be part of the National Electrical Code? Cybersecurity is actually already a part of several different codes and standards, and now we're having to figure out whether or not we want to incorporate it in the NEC. Uh, the threat of a cyber criminal changing the trip points of your breaker at your house probably isn't anything to worry about. Changing the trip points at a hospital and changing the electronic trip unit from 2,000 amps down to 50 amps and watching the hospital lose power, well, that's probably a very real concern. So it'll be interesting to see what we end up doing in the 2023 NEC. But for right now, we do recognize that we can use a password to restrict the settings for an adjustable trip circuit breaker. The next thing that changed here is 240.21, which is location in circuit, and this is relating to feeder taps. So the starting point of a tap was clarified. This is something that really wasn't a change per se, but more of just a clarification and not, not really a technical change. So when we look at 240.21, the first thing we read is that conductors have to have ground fault and short circuit and overload protection provided at the beginning of the circuit unless allowed in A through H. So if I have my 20 amp circuit breaker for my bathroom, for example, that provides my ground fault, my short circuit, and my overload protection. If I plug in three curling irons and five hair dryers in my bathroom, it's going to trip. That was an overload recovered. If I had a short circuit, maybe for some reason I, uh, I decided I wanted to take my hair scissors and cut the cord of the curling iron while it's turned on. Well, that would be a short circuit, 20 amp breaker is going to trip. Likewise, if I have a ground fault, if one of the ungrounded conductors, the hot conductor, touches a metal object that's connected to an equipment ground or the earth, that would be a ground fault and the 20 amp breaker once again is going to trip. So normally, we use one circuit breaker to provide all three forms of protection. If you're not really up to speed on overcurrent and ground faults and short circuits and overloads, let me recommend two videos that are on my page. Number one, I have a, vo a whole video that does nothing but cover feeder taps, and I think you'll find it beneficial. The other video that I'm going to recommend is my video on air conditioners, and that goes into much greater detail about what a ground fault, a short circuit, or an overload is, and how a circuit breaker or fuse can provide one or more of those types of protection. So again, the general rule here says that you have to provide protection against all types of overcurrent at the start of the circuit. If we keep on reading, it says conductors that are protected in a way described in A through H, which is going to be your feeder taps, your transformer secondary conductors, I think batteries are in there, a couple of other oddities. Conductors that are protected in a way described in A through H must not supply another conductor unless it's protected in accordance with 240.4. Okay, so on the left, I have my feeders. These are not feeder taps, these are feeders. Maybe they're uh, a 100 amp wire that's supplied by a 100 amp circuit breaker, and it goes into these, uh, into these power taps here, these power distribution blocks. And then I tap some eight gauge wire out of those and feed some 40 amp fuse disconnects. Over here on the right, that would be a tap conductor because a tap conductor as defined in 240.2 is actually just any wire that is protected against overcurrent on its supply side by a breaker that exceeds the normal rules. So you either size a breaker in accordance with the regular rules and, and that's not a tap, that's just a regular installation, or you comply with the tap rules if the breaker or fuse is bigger than we would normally use for protecting those wires. Or if you don't do either of those two, you get written up as a violation. So that's pretty much it. If I read this one more time, it says conductors that are protected in a way described in A through H, like a feeder tap, must not supply another conductor unless it's protected in accordance with 240.4. All right, so all we're saying here is look, you can tap the feeder as many times as you'd like. What you're not allowed to do is tap 
the tap conductor. So I couldn't tie onto this 8 gauge wire and use 14 gauge wire and go to a 15 amp fuse disconnect. That would be a violation because the tap cannot supply another conductor that's not protected in accordance with the general requirements. Now a feeder can be tapped at any point on the load side of the overcurrent device in accordance with 1 through 5, but they cannot use the allowance of 240.4b. All right, I want to go back one slide here because I think when most of us uh, visualize a feeder tap, we're thinking something that looks like this, where you've got a large wire that's properly protected, and then you take multiple small wires and apply the feeder taps. And yeah, that is a feeder tap, but that's not the only way that I can do a feeder tap. Remember, a feeder tap is just a wire that doesn't meet the normal rules. So here I've got a 400 amp breaker. Could I install 200 amp wire coming right out of the terminals of that breaker? Yes. That doesn't comply with the normal rules. We all agree with that. But if I can make it comply with the feeder tap rules, then it would be okay. So what would those feeder tap rules consist of? Well, it depends on a couple of variables. It depends on how long the conductors are, 10 feet or 25 feet. There's some kind of obscure uh, taps as well. And then the other one would be the outside tap of unlimited length. So if you comply with one of the feeder tap requirements, then sure, you could run 200 amp wire right off the load side of a 400 amp breaker. And again, that's not new. That's simply a clarification that they made in the 2020 code. So what are these tap rules? Well, again, I've got a whole video covering it if you want to check it out and I recommend it. But for example, a 10 foot feeder tap. A 10 foot feeder tap, and that's the length of the tapped conductors, are allowed if the ampacity of the tap carries the load and is not less than the rating of the overcurrent device that they terminate to on their load end. All right, so if I go back here, I've got a 400 amp breaker supplying 200 amp wire. Well, maybe if I can keep these wires less than 10 feet and they terminate to a 200 amp fuse or a 200 amp circuit breaker, then we might be okay. If we keep reading, we've got some other criteria like the wires not extending beyond the equipment they supply, keeping them in a raceway, and ensuring that the ampacity of the tap conductors is not less than one-tenth of the rating of the upstream device, in that case the 400 amp device. Um, interesting to note that item four, that whole concept goes away if you're keeping your feeder conductors outside, so uh, your feeder taps outside. So again, not really a technical change, but kind of a clarification. 240.33, however, is definitely a technical change, and 240.33 is vertical position. Installing overcurrent device enclosures horizontally is no longer an option in most instances. All right, so overcurrent device enclosures have to be mounted vertically. Previous versions of the code said that they had to be mounted vertically unless that wasn't practical or, practic or practicable. I don't remember which word they used. Um, circuit breakers that are mounted horizontally must clearly indicate if they are on or off. Okay, let me address the second sentence here because it's kind of confusing when you first read it. The breakers mounted horizontally must indicate if they're on or off. Well, if the enclosure has to be mounted vertically, how are the breakers mounted horizontally? That kind of threw me for a loop the first time I read that, and it's actually quite simple. If your enclosure is mounted vertically, your breakers are going to be mounted horizontally. So it's not quite as, uh, as difficult as we might think. Now, what was interesting about this is I think historically, most of us, myself included, when we read this section, it says that the enclosure has to be mounted vertically. So I think of the enclosure being mounted like this and not mounted horizontally unless that was not practical. What I never considered is mounting it like this, face up or face down. <laughs> face up or face down. Um, I'm going to keep that in the video. Why not? So <laughs> it's kind of interesting because I never thought about that, but it really is a rather unsafe installation in a lot of instances. Here in this uh, picture, this is actually at my, at my in-law's house, and no, I didn't wire it. This is their air conditioner disconnect, and it is mounted face down. 
Now, I would tell you that as an ex-inspector myself, I would not have accepted that installation. I don't think that complies with the working space requirements in 110.26. I don't think that you can actually maintain that equipment safely. And that is a code requirement in 110.26. Before you read A, it says, look, everything has to be capable of being worked on safely. And I don't think that complies with that. But now we have definite distinct language saying that you're not allowed to do that. Now, what's interesting is the original requirement was only going in the first draft of the 2020 code. It was only going to say that overcurrent device enclosures shall not be installed facing upward. And the reason for that was because it's actually a fairly common uh, practice in laundromats to install a panel board facing upward. And when I first read that, quite frankly, I didn't believe it. I thought, oh, give me a break. That is not a common practice. Maybe there's one laundromat in the middle of nowhere where they mounted the panel board face up and it's the only one on the planet and we don't need to write code rules for that. Uh, well, I was wrong. This is actually a fairly common practice. I think it's a terrible practice, uh, but it's relatively common. So they made a change in Article 408 for panel boards that says panel boards are not allowed to be installed facing upward. So that takes care of panel boards facing upwards, but what about panel boards facing downwards or fuse disconnect enclosures facing downwards like the one that we have right here? Uh, this is now a violation. Here we've got, uh, assuming that there's overcurrent protection in this enclosure, then this would be a violation under the 2020 code. Um, I think this is probably not the best practice if you can avoid it, installing overcurrent device enclosures in a suspended ceiling facing downward. But I'm here to tell you, I've seen quite a few installations where this was really just about the only feasible way to do it. And I'll tell you where you see this is in hospitals. If you've never had the chance to, uh, to move a ceiling tile in a hospital and poke your head up there and look around, it, it, it's quite jarring just how much equipment is above the ceiling in a hospital. And that's because it's, it's a hospital. I mean, they have everything you can imagine. And a lot of the equipment above the ceiling requires a disconnecting means. And of course, the disconnecting means has to be within sight of the equipment. And not only does it have to be within sight, which is probably above the ceiling, but if it wasn't within sight and was lockable, you, you don't want to have it in the patient room where people can play around with it. You don't want to put it in one of the hundreds of panels throughout a big hospital because which panel is it? Really the only feasible way and, and often the best way to do it is to install a, a, a disconnecting means in the ceiling facing downward. It doesn't face side to side because there's just no way to get three foot or three and a half or three feet or four feet, whatever might be necessary. Another change that they made in Article 240 is to 240.67, which is arc energy reduction. Another method for reducing arc energy was added, documentation requirements were expanded, and the system must now be tested when it's first installed. And I want to point out, 240.67 is for fuses, but 240.87 has similar requirements for circuit breakers. There are some different, uh, different methods that you can achieve compliance, but similar changes were made in 240.87, so I'm not going to cover both. Um, again, documentation requirements, testing requirements, things of that nature. So when we look at the rule 240.67, arc energy reduction, it says effective January 1st of 2020, if fuses rated 1200 amps or more are installed, then arc energy reduction is required in accordance with A and B. All right, so this is 100% having to do with worker safety. Uh, if a person is involved in an arc flash incident because they're doing some justified energized work, it's important to remember that even if you have the appropriately rated personal protective equipment, all that that does is give you a 50-50 chance of not getting a second degree burn. That's what property rated PPE does for you. So having, having had a second degree burn myself and having lived through burn treatment, um, I can tell you that it's not something that I would wish on an enemy. Uh, it involves 
quite frankly, getting your skin scraped off with a brush at the hospital. And it's a, it's a truly terrible ordeal. So if you have the properly rated personal protective equipment, there's still a 50-50 chance that you end up in the burn unit. So maybe safety by design is a better approach than just dressing appropriately. And that's what this is talking about, reducing the arc energy to make sure that we're not making a terrible situation even worse. So how do I reduce the arc energy? Well, the arc energy, which is basically how nasty the fireball is during an arc fault, during an, an arcing event, during an arc flash, the arc energy is a function of three variables, the voltage, the available fault current, and the clearing time of the overcurrent device, how long you're exposed to it. Now, I can't really change the voltage. I mean, if it's 480, it's 480. If it's 208, it's 208. I can't do a lot there. And changing the available fault current, I can do some things with the available fault current to make it lower or make it higher, but that sometimes can make it better or make it worse, depending on some other thing. You know, if I lower the, the available fault current, that might increase the clearing time of the breaker, and we didn't really gain any ground. So the voltage, the available fault current, and the clearing time of the overcurrent device. Now, the clearing time of the overcurrent device is definitely something that I can play around with. And that ultimately is what 240.67 and 240.87 are talking about. So the first thing, 240.67a documentation, says the documentation showing that the method that we're going to use will actually operate at or below the available arcing current must be made available for those who need it. All right, so looking at the picture, this is a reduced energy let through switch. So a, uh, I think the, the uh, Eaton version of it, I think is called an arms switch. Uh, you know, uh, the, what is it? Reduced uh, maintenance switch, something like that. So arc flash, arc energy reducing maintenance switch. So we need to have documentation. Maybe we have a sticker that says, look, an arc flash study is provided and it's located here in the equipment room or somewhere else. So we need to have documentation showing that it's actually going to work. How do I reduce the clearing time? How do I actually achieve this arc energy reduction that we're talking about? Well, 240.67b says that a fuse has to have a clearing time of 0.07 seconds or less at the available arcing current or one of the following. If your fuse opens at 0.07 seconds, that's a pretty quick acting fuse. It's fast enough anyway. And we're going to say, look, if it, if it opens that quickly, that in and of itself reduces the arc energy to a certain extent that we're, that we're going to find acceptable in the code. If your fuse does not open that quickly, then one of the following set to operate at less than the available arcing current must be provided. Option one is differential relaying. Option two is what most people tend to use, at least the ones that I've seen. And that's an arc energy, uh, an arc energy reducing maintenance switch with status indication. I hit the switch, turn it into maintenance mode, the light turns on, there's my static my uh, status indication. And what does that do to the installation? Well, if we go back, and it might be kind of difficult to read the values on the uh, stickers here, but this is the same piece of equipment in normal mode and in maintenance mode. So under normal conditions, if we have an arc flash incident, then the arc flash hazard boundary is 22 feet 11 inches. So what does that number mean? Well, that means if I'm within 22 feet 11 inches, and of course the closer you get, the worse it's going to be, but at 22 foot 11 inches, that means if I have no clothes on whatsoever, the incident energy is at least 1.2 calories per square centimeter, and I could receive a second degree burn. So the arc flash hazard boundary is where you would get a second degree burn. The incident energy is how nasty the fireball is, 105 calories per square centimeter. All right, well, that's a ton. They make PPE that's suitable for 105 calories. I think uh, right now, and, and right now it's April of, 
March of 2021, the highest suit that I know of right now is 140 calories. So they certainly make 105 calorie PPE, but why expose yourself to that kind of a fireball if you don't need to, even if you are dressed appropriately? Take a look at what happens when I hit the switch and I go to maintenance mode. My arc flash boundary goes from 22 foot 11 down to four feet. And my incident energy <clears throat> goes from 105 calories all the way down to six calories. And six calories is a very minimal amount of personal protective equipment. Um, usually that would just be an, an eight calorie, uh, you know, long sleeve shirt that's rated eight calories long sleeve pants or a coverall. Of course, you're gonna have your standard protection, your uh, your hearing protection, uh, protection, your shock protection with rubber gloves and heavy duty leather protectors over them. You're also going to need appropriate footwear, a face shield, a balaclava, and things of that nature. But that's a lot more comfortable than a 105 calorie spaceman outfit. And for getting comfort, it's just significantly safer. So when I hit the clearing time, it reduces it down to that. So that allows me to work on this if I'm doing justified energized work. And justified energized work, hopefully that is diagnostics. We're measuring voltage. We're checking things. I don't like to have people in there doing repairs when it's energized. You know, measuring voltage on energized equipment, that's something we kind of have to do. Making actual adjustments to equipment while it's energized, that's something we can usually avoid. So while we're measuring for voltage or we're troubleshooting, <clears throat> I turn it to maintenance mode, reduce my risk substantially, and then when I'm done, <clears throat> I can take it back off of maintenance mode. Now, why not just leave it in maintenance mode? That's something that, that people wanna know. Well, why not just leave it in maintenance mode if it's that much safer for the worker, just keep it in maintenance mode. Well, the problem with that is we don't want it to be so sensitive that any fault in the building ends up knocking out this 2000 amp circuit breaker. So leaving it in maintenance mode would often uh, result in us losing all of our selective coordination if we have it. So leaving it in maintenance mode sounds great in theory. In practice, it's usually not an issue, not an option. There's other options. Energy reducing active arc flash mitigation systems. Uh, that would be something where uh, there, there's one example, I think uh, Eaton has one, I'm, I'm guessing Schneider does, uh, I think General Electric does, or whoever they are now, <laughs> where you've got optical fiber lines inside of the equipment and it's actually looking for a change in the brightness inside of the equipment. It's looking for an arc. And when I say looking, I mean quite literally, it, it's visually looking for the cue of an arc. And will uh, and will extinguish it with an arc quenching device. So that would be an energy reducing active system. We could also use new to this version of the code current limiting electronically actuated fuses. Current limiting fuses, by their very nature, are energy reducing because they're so fast. Or item five, other approved and equivalent means. Maybe somebody invents something tomorrow that's better than all of those ideas. Well, we're certainly not going to prohibit you from using them. There's an informational note that tells us why we're doing this. It says, look, the trip settings for energy reducing maintenance switches can be reduced to allow workers to work inside the arc flash hazard boundary <clears throat> and then be reset to normal. One more example from the same facility. The arc flash hazard boundary is an astonishing 200 feet and four inches. <laughs> four inches kind of makes me chuckle every time I read it. Incident energy is 71 calories until I hit it to maintenance mode. And then it goes all the way from 200 feet down to seven feet. And my incident energy from 71 calories all the way down to three and a half. So you can see the value in having an energy reducing maintenance switch or other similar way to reduce the arc energy. The last thing that changed here in the 2020 code is we added 240.67 and 240.87 for circuit breakers, saying that the method that we're using to reduce the clearing time <clears throat> has to be tested by a qualified person when it's first installed on site, and a record of the testing has to be made available to the AHJ. This could be uh, done by primary injection, but there are some protective uh, options 
that you cannot test with primary injection. So just default back to the instructions. Whatever the instructions tell you as far as testing, that's what we need to do. Okay, the last thing that changed is 240.88 reconditioned equipment. The applications of reconditioned circuit breakers and components are now addressed. So reconditioned equipment was probably the single biggest the, the, the most talked about and the most thoroughly discussed issue in the entire 2020 code change process. There were changes throughout the NEC to address reconditioned equipment, and I don't want to spend an hour today talking about reconditioned equipment in this video. Maybe I'll do a video in the future that covers nothing but reconditioned equipment. But circuit breakers is one of the things that gets reconditioned perhaps more than anything else. And that's where a lot of this discussion came from. And we're seeing the evolution of it here in the 2020 code. So what it says is reconditioned equipment must be listed as reconditioned. And the original listing mark must be removed if it actually had a listing mark. It's important to remember that Generally speaking, circuit breakers and fuses do not need to be listed products. They don't. There is no requirement for circuit breakers and fuses to be listed, not in a general sense. Usually they are, but they're not required to be, unless they're reconditioned. And that's what this says. Reconditioned equipment must be listed as reconditioned and the original listing mark must be removed. There are certain things that I can recondition and certain things that I cannot recondition. Item one, molded case circuit breakers may not be reconditioned. Well, this is kind of where the whole thing comes from. What can you do with a molded case circuit breaker? You see, the definition of recondition in Article 100 ultimately says that the piece of equipment is broken. It doesn't work. And then it's restored to operating condition. So it, it's, it's usually rebuilt. It doesn't necessarily include replacing one component and you know, replacing it with, with a similar component on a one-to-one -one basis. But if I open it up, rip it apart, replace all the guts, that would be reconditioning. Well, you can't do that with a molded case circuit breaker. Not only does the code say that you're not allowed to, but physically, how would you do it? A molded case circuit breaker is a sealed unit. They're, they're riveted shut. We don't want people getting into molded case circuit breakers because if they could, they would. <laughs> and we don't need people changing the trip points on the breakers inside of their house. It's easy enough to go to the store and buy a single pole 30 and put it on a breaker that keeps tripping that used to be a 15 amp breaker. We definitely don't need people opening up the 15 amp breaker and wiggling around the bimetal and everything else and getting it to behave differently. So no reconditioning of molded case circuit breakers. That is absolutely not allowed. If a molded case circuit breaker goes bad, you throw it in the garbage. That's what you do. That's, the, that's where the reconditioning starts and ends. You throw it away. Now, when it comes to low or medium voltage power circuit breakers like these guys here, well, obviously when that thing goes bad, I don't get me and my friends and pick it up and throw it in the dumpster. Something like that, I'm going to send off and have them rebuild, remanufacture, refurbish, recondition. And all of those things mean the same thing. So I'm going to send it off, have somebody rip the guts out of it, replace it with all new components and everything else. They'll calibrate it, they'll test it, they'll perform any sort of lubrication, whatever might be necessary. That would be a reconditioned circuit breaker. Then it has to get listed and then you can put it back into play as a reconditioned circuit breaker. Item three, high voltage circuit breakers are allowed to be reconditioned. So obviously if one of these goes bad, uh, you don't back up a dump truck and get a crane, you know, <laughs> and throw the whole thing away. You're, you're gonna recondition whatever parts of it need to be reconditioned. So we recognize that. When it comes to the individual components, of circuit breakers, low voltage power circuit breaker electronic trip units may not be reconditioned. Okay, so you can recondition the breaker, just not the electronic trip unit. Well, that makes sense. I mean, that's like a computer chip. You're not gonna, what are you gonna do? Rip off, rip off the, the board and start getting in there with your soldering iron? You know, yeah, that, that, that's a replaceable component. So we don't want to try to recondition the electronic trip unit. 
If the electronic trip unit goes bad, buy a new one. And that's, that's that. We can recondition electromechanical protective relays and current transformers, however. These are some electronic, uh, some electromechanical current, some electromechanical protective relays. And inside of them, it really is almost like a Swiss clock. There's, there's gears and springs and tiny little wires and gadgets and things. And, and those are designed to be removed and uh, reconditioned as needed. So we do recognize that those components can be reconditioned. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and ring the bell.